Today in the workshop, we'll be designing and building linear power supplies. We'll see how to use transformers, rectifiers, filters, and regulators to build custom power sources for our projects. We'll also construct the linear DC power supply for the workshop. We've got the power today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and today we are going to be working with linear power supplies. Now we've worked with power supplies before. We took an old ATX computer supply and made it into a workbench supply. We also built another supply that used the power brick of an old computer. But both of those power supplies were switching supplies and today we're going to cover linear power supplies. Now linear power supplies are no longer as popular as switching power supplies and the main reason is the size and the weight of them. Another reason is that when you get to large power supplies, switching power supplies are less expensive to build, although for small supplies, a linear supply still has some advantages. Linear power supplies are no longer used with computers except for specialized medical and instrumentation computers, but in the early days of personal computers, they were the only type of supply that we used. And if you think about boxes like the Altair or the IMSE or the Southwest Technical Product Computer, that came out in the mid-1970s, you might remember them as being a lot like boat anchors in terms of size and weight. And that was mostly due to the linear power supply that they used. The large transformer in the supply really weighs a lot. But linear supplies do have some advantages over switching supplies. Although they're not as efficient, they are lower in noise, and that can be a real advantage for instrumentation, for audio work, and for some radio work. And so you'll find that a lot of high-end audio equipment, for example, uses a linear supply. Another great thing about a linear supply is that you can design and build your own, whereas a switching supply is a much more complex project, and you're probably better off buying one than building one. So I've kind of divided today's video into two different sections. At the beginning, we'll go through the usual introduction to the topic, and we'll do a number of experiments with linear supplies, both fixed and variable voltages, and both positive and negative ones. But after that, in the second part of the video, we will build a linear bench supply, and I'll show you how I went through selecting the components, how I went through building and labeling the chassis, and putting everything together so we'll have a true project. And I may Made the project using components that you can easily obtain and if you check out the article that accompanies this video you'll find links to the sources for those components. So let's begin by learning a little bit about linear power supplies. A DC power supply is a device that converts alternating current or AC into direct current or DC. It provides a regulated DC output at a specific voltage. DC power supplies also provide isolation from the AC line. DC power supplies can provide positive or negative output voltages, or in many cases, both of them. These devices can also serve as battery chargers. There are two types of DC power supplies, linear and switching. In a linear power supply, the AC mains or line voltage is fed directly into a power transformer. In most cases, the output of the power transformer is lower than that of the input voltage, but you can design DC power supplies to create higher voltages as well. The output of the power transformer is fed into a rectifier circuit. A rectifier circuit converts the AC into a rather choppy form of direct current. The output of the rectifier is fed into a filter circuit, which smooths out the output and produces smooth direct current. The filter circuit is then connected to a voltage regulator, which provides regulated steady voltage at the desired output level. In a switching power supply, the AC line or mains voltage is fed directly into a rectifier circuit to be converted into high voltage DC. This high voltage DC is then used to power a high frequency oscillator. This high frequency oscillator is fed into a high frequency transformer. Because of the higher frequencies involved, the high frequency transformer can be made much smaller and lighter than the power transformer used in a linear power supply. The output of the high frequency transformer is fed into another rectifier circuit where it again becomes a rather choppy and noisy form of direct current. 
This direct current is fed into a filter circuit which smooths it out and removes some of the high frequency noise. It is also fed back to a control circuit which then goes back to the oscillator and this is the method that switching power supplies use to regulate their output voltage. Linear power supplies are not that efficient. They have an efficiency of 60% or less. Switching supplies, on the other hand, are quite efficient and have an efficiency of 80% or more. Linear power supplies require a large power transformer due to the low frequencies used in line or mains voltage. Because of the high frequencies they use, switching supplies can use a much smaller and lighter high frequency transformer. Linear power supplies, however, provide a very low noise direct current output. The output of a switching power supply often contains remnants of switching noise, which can cause interference in audio circuitry and other sensitive devices. A linear supply also has a very fast response. In other words, if a large amount of current is suddenly required, a linear supply can provide it very quickly. Switching supplies are not as fast to respond as linear supplies, although in most situations their performance is adequate. Because of their large power transformers, linear supplies are very large in both size and weight. Switching supplies can be made very compact and lightweight. Because of the low efficiency of linear supplies, they have a very high heat dissipation. Switching supplies, on the other hand, are more efficient and have a lower heat dissipation. Linear supplies are the most cost effective when the application is a low powered one that requires less than 10 watts of power. Above 10 watts, switching supplies are more cost effective. Today we'll be working with linear power supplies, which means we'll be working with power transformers, rectifiers, and voltage regulators. Linear power supplies are often used in high powered audio equipment, radio equipment, and in instrumentation and medical equipment where their low noise is an advantage. So let's take a look at a few of the components we'll be using in order to construct a linear power supply. Now here are some components that can be used in the construction of linear power supply. Now over here I have two different power transformers. They're both about equivalent, although you can see they are different shapes from one another. And this style of transformer is one that is meant to mount on a printed circuit board, but it's a low profile type of a power transformer. This is a more conventional design that just bolts onto a chassis and has all of its connections on this side over here. Now, over here we've got some rectifiers, and I've got three different rectifiers for you. These two are what are called bridge rectifiers, and I'll be explaining that term in a few moments. And this is one that's meant to bolt onto a chassis. And this one is actually meant to be placed on directly onto a printed circuit board. And it also has a hole in it so you can bolt a heat sink onto it because these things can get a bit warm when they run. This is a more conventional rectifier diode over here. This is just a 1N4007. And it's a common rectifier diode that you can also use to build rectifiers. Now another section of the supply is going to be the filtering section. And I've got a 20 2200 microfarad electrolytic capacitor over here rated at 63 volts and these are 50 volt 10 microfarad tantalum capacitors which can be used on the output of the power supply tantalums actually do have advantages over electrolytic capacitors but when you need a very large value capacitor an electrolytic is pretty well the practical choice and finally these devices over here are voltage regulators uh, they're three pin voltage regulators. They look the same, but they're actually three different types of three pin regulators. And you can get a variety of these. You can get them in positive or negative configurations. Uh, they are used on the output of the supply to provide a smooth regulated voltage. These two are actually fixed ones, whereas this one can supply a variable voltage. So now that we've taken a look at a few of those components, let's see how we actually use them in our linear power supplies. A transformer is a simple passive electrical component. The purpose of a transformer is to transfer alternating current from its input to its output or outputs. The transformer will also isolate the input from the output. A step-up transformer outputs a higher voltage than its input voltage. 
Conversely, a step-down transformer will output a lower voltage than its input voltage. An isolation transformer outputs the same voltage as its input voltage. A transformer consists of multiple coils of wire wrapped around a common core, and its schematic symbol is shown above. When alternating current is applied to the input coil, the varying magnetic flux induces an output in the output coil or coils. The ratio of the number of turns in the coil between input and output determines the transformer's output. For a hypothetical example, if the input coil has a thousand turns and the output coil is a hundred turns, the output will be one-tenth of the input. If you reverse that with the input having a hundred turns and the output having a thousand, the output will be ten times that of the input. The size or gauge of the wire determines the current capability of the transformer, and this is why high current transformers are very large devices. A common configuration for transformers is to have a center tap on the output, a point where the voltage is half the voltage of the total output voltage. Transformers can also be tapped on the input to allow multiple input voltages, and this is a common configuration for equipment that is meant to run on North American power levels, which are around 120 volts, and European ones, which are usually around 220 volts. When selecting a transformer, you'll select it by its input and output voltage specifications. Another rating you need to consider is the current capacity of the transformer, which will be measured in amperes or volt amps. The transformer I've been illustrating so far is a very common design, but another design is the toroidal transformer. While a bit more expensive, these transformers have an advantage in that they don't radiate an excessive magnetic field, as the magnetic field is constrained to the center of the core. This is very useful for audio equipment and other sensitive equipment, which may be sensitive to the EMF generated by most common transformers. A rectifier is a device that converts AC into DC. The most common type of a rectifier is a diode, but some older designs use selenium plates and some newer designs are using MOSFETs. There are several different configurations for a rectifier. The configuration illustrated here is a half-wave rectifier, and it consists simply of a diode on the output of the transformer. Note that the output DC signal is actually a series of pulses on the positive side, with the negative side being cut off. If the diode was reversed, it would be the opposite. A very common configuration is the full-wave rectifier, and it can be wired in a number of different fashions. The illustration here is one that is very common and is called a bridge rectifier and consists of four diodes. You'll note that in this case, the output is a series of positive signals, but there are twice as many of them as both sides of the AC waveform are included. This is a very efficient method of using a rectifier and is probably the most common. You can also build a full wave rectifier using only two diodes and a center tap transformer. Note that in this case, however, the input voltage, which is the output voltage of the transformer, needs to be twice as high as that for the bridge rectifier in order to achieve the same DC output voltage. The filter circuit smooths the ripple in the DC output, allowing for smooth direct current. Generally, a filter is just a capacitor. In some cases, an inductor is also used to reduce high-frequency noise, although this is more common in switching supplies than it is in linear supplies. The filter capacitor is placed across the voltage output. The energy stored in the capacitor can also be useful for current surges, occasional surges of current that exceed the ratings of the power supply. In this diagram, we see the filter capacitor across the output after a full-wave rectifier. Note that there's also a resistor added here. This is generally a high value resistor of one kilo ohm or more and is used simply to discharge the capacitor if the power supply is turned off with no load connected to it. A voltage regulator is a circuit that provides a steady output voltage from a fluctuating input voltage. These can be built to have a fixed voltage output or a variable voltage output. You can get positive or negative voltage regulators. 
You can build voltage regulators with an integrated circuit, or you can use discrete components. You can also add a power transistor to the integrated circuit to increase its current capability. Here we see a fixed voltage regulator on a power supply that consists of a bridge rectifier and a filter capacitor. Note that there's also a capacitor on the output of the regulator. This is a lower value capacitor and it's usually standard practice to include one. And this diagram shows a variable voltage regulator. The ground pin on a variable voltage regulator has been replaced by an adjustment pin and it goes to a resistive voltage divider that allows you to set the output voltage. Now I want to show you in this demonstration the effect of a half-wave rectifier and as you recall a half-wave rectifier is essentially just a diode. Now what I have over here is I have my transformer hooked up to my oscilloscope right now and you can see the output over here and of course the output is a 60 hertz signal. You can see down over there the frequency is 60 hertz or very close to 60 hertz anyway. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a diode in series with all of this so I'm going to take off this lead over here and place a diode on and you can see the effect right now the uh, positive side is being uh, passed by the diode the negative side is not being passed and if I reverse the diode we should have the opposite effect so let's just turn that around And there we go, and let's just move the trigger point down so we get it. There There we have the negative side. So the diode is basically just the course allowing current to only pass in one direction and knocking off the current in the other direction. And so that is the output of a half-wave rectifier. So I have a little demonstration here for you, and this is a demonstration of the effect of both a load and a filter capacitor on the output of a bridge rectifier. Now I've got a transformer over here. This is not a very high current transformer at all. It's about 34 volts center tapped at a very low current actually and it is feeding into a bridge rectifier and the output of the bridge rectifier is currently on the oscilloscope that you can see over here. Now I'll just remove the scope probe for a moment just so you can see where the baseline is. So that's the zero point over there. I'll put the probe back in and you can see of course there's a great deal of ripple. There's no filter capacitor or output put load on this at all. Now one interesting thing about this, and this is the nature of the bridge rectifier of course, is that the frequency that I'm measuring here is 120 hertz and not uh, 60 hertz. I'm not sure if you can see the writing down there. And that of course makes sense for the bridge rectifier. It's twice the line frequency that I have. I live in Canada so my line frequency is 60 hertz as it would be in the United States. Now I'm going to put a load across it. What I've got over here is just a few resistors actually these are three 16 ohm power resistors connected in series for a total of 48 ohms as I said this is a very low uh, current device over here and we're getting about 35 volts out of it so this should pull about three quarters of an amp here and I'm just going to touch that onto the output and observe the scope when I do that notice how the output is reduced quite a bit when I put a load onto it over here now, uh, the real thing I wanted to show you, though, is the effect of a filter capacitor. And I've got this as a 2,000 microfarad capacitor. It's rated at 63 volts. Now, when you do this, you have to be absolutely certain you get the polarity right because connecting a large electrolytic capacitor backwards can have some rather negative and explosive consequences. So I'm going to touch that across the output and take a look at the scope right now. And as you can see, there's... Basically all of the ripple is gone. It's a very flat DC output that I get because of the filter capacitor. And of course that's the function of the filter capacitor. It uh, charges up and discharges and the discharge time is slower than the next cycle. So it keeps everything nice and smooth at the top over here. And if I remove it, we're back to the same display that we had before. So as you can see, a filter capacitor and a load can really affect the output of your bridge rectifier. So let's recap what we've done so far. We've taken a transformer and reduced our AC line voltage to a manageable level. 
Then we've taken that manageable level AC voltage and fed it into a rectifier device which produced a rather choppy form of direct current or DC. Then we stuck a capacitor across the output and lo and behold the DC all smoothed out and is wonderful. So essentially we've built a linear power supply. However what we've built so far is an unregulated power supply. So the output voltage won't necessarily always be the same. It can be affected by fluctuations on the input AC voltage and it can also be affected by the load that you place across the power supply's output. For most applications we want a fixed voltage and in order to obtain that we need to add one more stage to our power supply and that is a voltage regulator. Now for high currents voltage regulators often employ things like MOSFETs and discrete circuitry but for lower currents i.e. things under about 3 amperes we can make use of integrated circuits that are specifically designed to be voltage regulators and there are a number of common ones out there. Right now we're going to experiment with three of them, a positive voltage regulator, a negative voltage regulator, and a variable positive one, one that can allow you to output different voltages rather than the fixed voltages that the previous two did. So let's start off by looking at how we're going to hook up our positive voltage regulator. For a fixed positive voltage regulator, I'll be using a 7812, which is a 12 volt positive voltage regulator. It's in a TO220 package, and you can see the pinouts over here. Now, this is one of the 7800 series of positive voltage regulators. In this series of voltage regulators, the last two digits indicate the output voltage. So you can see our 7812 gives 12 volts out, a 7805 would give 5 volts, a 7815, 15 volts, etc, etc. These voltage regulators are available from a number of different manufacturers and in a number of different packages, and some of them can handle current up to 1.5 amperes. They all feature a short circuit shutdown function, and they also feature an overheat shutdown function. Now in the TO220 package illustrated here, the tab of the package is connected to ground. So if you wish to use a heat sink, and you will if you're pulling the current near the maximum level, you can directly connect your heat sink to ground and to the voltage regulator with no problem. Now here's the circuit that we're going to be using to test our voltage regulator. As you can see, we have our AC input going into a power transformer, and after that going into a bridge rectifier to create some choppy form of DC voltage. There's a filter capacitor that's placed across the circuit, and you might notice that I don't have a dropping resistor across the capacitor. It's not necessary because we're placing the voltage regulator on the output of this. The voltage regulator is connected next, and it just has connections for input, ground, and output. And across the output, I also have an output capacitor. Now, I'm not specifying values for these. In my experiments, I'm using 1,000 microfarads for my filter capacitor and 2.2 microfarads for the output capacitor, but you could use different values, and the output capacitor doesn't even need to be a polarized one. You could use something like a 100 nanofarad capacitor if you want. It's just there to stabilize the voltage regulator. So let's hook this up onto a solderless breadboard and see what our output is. Now here's a demonstration of the 7812 positive voltage regulator, the 12 volt regulator. And if you can see the multimeter, you can see it's pretty close to 12 volts. 12.03 volts is very close to 12. Now what I've done is I've taken that transformer that I showed you earlier, my test transformer, and here's a bridge rectifier over here. And the rest of the circuitry is here on the solderless breadboard. So you can see the big filter capacitor in here and the smaller capacitor on the output and the uh, 7812 itself. Now if you're going to be trying to pull appreciable current out of this, and of course I'm hardly pulling any current out of it because I haven't got a load on it right now, you will require a heat sink on this device. And with this device you can just bolt it to the chassis because the tab is connected directly to ground. Now there are other versions of this voltage regulator, more modern versions that are low voltage drop regulators. They 
they dissipate less heat, they're more efficient, and you could substitute those as well in a modern design. If you do that, I would suggest that you check carefully on the specifications to make sure that the tab on it is grounded, because that's not true of all voltage regulators, and you certainly don't want to connect the heat sink directly to that that is grounded. If the tab isn't grounded, you would have to use an insulator or something like that when you're installing the heat sink. But other than that consideration, this is a very simple regulator to use. It's available, of course, not just in the 12 volt variety, but in all the common varieties. And so if you're trying to build a logic supply with 5 volts, or if you need a 15 volt supply or something, this is still an excellent choice. For a fixed negative voltage regulator, I'll be using a 7912, which is a negative equivalent of the 7812. Note the pinouts on this regulator. They are not the same as the pinouts on the 7812. And that's very important to note because many people just assume they are. And if you try to hook it up the other way, it obviously won't work. Now, this is again as part of the series of 7900 negative voltage regulators. And like the 7800 series, the last two digits of the part number indicate the output voltage. It has similar specifications with a current up to 1.5 amperes in some packages, short circuit shutdown function, and an overheat shutdown function. Now, one very important thing to note is that in the TO220 package, the tab is connected to the input, not the ground. And so if you're attaching a heat sink to this, you cannot ground your heat sink. If you're using your chassis as a heat sink, which would be grounded, you'll have to put some sort of an insulator, such as a mica insulator kit, in between the voltage regulator and the heat sink itself to avoid attaching that to ground. Because if you ground the input, you'll be shorting it out, and that's not a good thing. Now the circuit for hooking this up is very similar to the positive regulator. Once again, we have our power transformer going to a bridge rectifier with a filter capacitor across it. Note a couple of things though. First of all, the hookup to the regulator is different, and the ground side is on the positive side, not the negative side, because we're looking for a negative output. Again, the same considerations go as it did for the positive regulator with the filter capacitors, and you can pretty well use any values you wish. Once again, I used a thousand microfarads for my filter capacitor, and the output capacitor I used a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. If you're using polarized capacitors on the output and you're definitely using them on the input, make certain that you have the polarity correct on them. So now let's go to the solderless breadboard and take a look at a demo of the 7912. Now I'm using the same arrangement for testing for the negative voltage regulator as I did for the positive one. I've got my external transformer and my bridge rectifier, and I've got it wired up on the solderless breadboard. And the big difference over here, of course, is that the common side is the positive side and not the negative side. And uh, since we're used to working with microcontrollers and things where we always deal with positive voltages, that is kind of backwards from the way that we think about it. But otherwise, the hookup is pretty well identical to that of the uh, 7812 regulator, the positive one. Now with the 7912, of course, if I wanted to add a heat sink onto it, as I mentioned, you can't just connect the heat sink that is connected to ground here because this tab over here is not connected to ground. And if you do that, you're going to create a very nasty short circuit. So you'd have to use some form of an insulator for the heat sink. Now, as you can see, the output voltage is pretty good. It's about 12.18 volts and it's staying constant, which is actually a pretty important thing as well. There are two things about a voltage regulator. Of course, the, one of the things is that it needs to deliver the correct voltage. And this is a 12 volt regulator, so it's pretty close to doing that. Uh, but the other thing is it needs to say consistent. And if you look at this, it's consistently a little bit off of 12 volts. And that's a good thing too. Uh, so again, this is an easy regulator to use. There are low dropout versions of this one as well if you want something more modern. But if you need a negative voltage for your project, either an audio project or maybe you're doing something with the old RS-232 bus, then this is an ideal regulator for you. 
For a variable positive regulator, I'm going to be using an LM317, which again is a classic regulator and is available in a TO220 package with the pinout that you see over here. This is an adjustable voltage regulator. It can output from 1.2 to 37 volts and has a maximum input voltage of 40 volts. As with the previous regulator, it's available in packages with current capabilities up to 1.5 amperes. It has the short circuit shutdown function and the overheat shutdown function. In addition to the voltage regulator, you're going to require two resistors to adjust the voltage output level. This voltage regulator is available in a TO220 package, and in this package, the tab is connected to the output. Once again, you cannot use a grounded heat sink with this. If you're going to use a heat sink that's attached to ground, you'll need to attach an insulator to it. Otherwise, you could use a heat sink that is not attached to ground. Now here's the circuitry for our variable positive test. Once again, we have the transformer, bridge rectifier, and filter capacitor. Note the hookup to the LM317. We also have a voltage divider built with a 220 ohm resistor and a 5K potentiometer. And this is how we will adjust the output voltage. Again, I have an output capacitor. I've used a tantalum capacitor, but you could use a ceramic capacitor as well. And my filter capacitor, I used 1000 microfarads. And for the output, I used 2.2 microfarads. So let's go and hook this onto the solderless breadboard and see the results. I've got my LM317 regulator hooked up over here on the solderless breadboard and you can see in the middle here is my little pot. Now this is the weak uh, link in the chain, this little pot actually, because it's just a really cheap little trim pot and so because of its tolerance the voltage is having a little bit of difficulty locking in. I was trying for about 8 volts. I've got 7.98 volts, 7.99 volts right now which is pretty good. What you need to do when you're doing something like this is to let let it stabilize for a little while before you adjust it. Now if I turn the pot we can see lower in the higher end here. I'll go all the way down to the bottom. I've got a little over a volt over here and if I go up onto the other end, I've got the multimeter by the way set on a 20 volt range. It is an auto ranging. So I can go all the way up and then I go past the auto range. So I can sweep it through a wide level of voltages and it does seem to work pretty well. Again, the tolerance of the pot and the 220 ohm resistor are the key factors into getting some accuracy out of this. Now this would be a great regulator to use if you need a substandard voltage. Let's say you needed 7.4 volts or something to emulate the uh, voltage that you would get out of a LiPo battery or something. You could set this for that specific voltage. So these are great regulators to use when one of the standard ones doesn't fit the bill. And you could also use it to build a variable power supply. If you're doing that, I would suggest using something like a precision 10 turn pot so that you could get more accuracy and stability out of it. But even despite its age, the LM317 is still a great variable voltage regulator. So now that we've covered all of the theory behind linear power supplies, it's time for the second half of this video, and that's where we actually build a linear power supply project. Now the power supply I'm going to build has a positive output. It is variable from about 2 to a little over 20 volts, but it also can be switched into three different fixed voltage outputs, and in my case they were 3.3, 5, and 12 volts. Now you can build the exact same power supply I did, and I've got links for all of the parts that I used in this power supply in the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. However, you could also use this just sort of as a guideline for building your own supply. In fact, that's really what I hope you go ahead and do. You may already have an existing case or you may have an existing power transformer, which is by far the most expensive component in the power supply, and you'd like to put those to use. So you could just use this as a guideline. So we're going to start off by taking a look at a number of different components, some of which I used in my power supply and some of which I didn't, but it'll give you a rough idea of the things that are available for building your own linear power supply. 
So I've got some parts out here to build a power supply. In fact, I've got more parts than what I need because I'm kind of waffling between two different designs based upon two different chassis. Now I've got the two chassis over here. This chassis is an interesting one. It's a taller chassis and it's consisting of a base and a cover. And one thing you'll notice is that there's got these plastic sides to it over here that hold it all together. There's also a front plate and a back plate, of course. And none of these are connected to each other electrically, the top, the sides, and the front and the back. So if you're interested in shielding, this may not be a perfect chassis for you, or you would have to shield it uh, with wires going to each metal piece. But with this, I could use this transformer, and this transformer would fit quite nicely into this chassis over here, but it doesn't leave a lot of room for everything else. The other chassis that I was looking at is this one over here. And this is a longer chassis. You can see the base over here, and here's a top for it, and it's got ventilation holes in it. And because of its height, I cannot put this transformer in. It's just a bit too tall. So what I am going to do is I am going to use this other transformer, and I'm going to put it in the chassis, and this will fit. But of course, this is one that needs to be mounted on a printed circuit board, or in my case, just a perf board, because I don't have time to design a printed circuit board. Now the advantage of this chassis is it's larger and I'll be able to put more things on it. I want to show you some of the things I have for it. Now for the power entry I found this wonderful thing on Amazon and I really would highly suggest using something like this if you're building a power supply. It makes things so much safer. This has, uh, this is the power plate at the back. It has uh, an input of course for a standard size extension cord or a standard size power cord, excuse me. It's got a power on off switch wired up and it's an illuminated switch as well and in a beautiful way it also has a fuse holder over here for a small fuse and I've got some other fuses over here because I'm going to replace this with a slow blow fuse because with a power supply there can be a surge of current when it first turns on I don't want to pop fuses when I don't need to but this is wonderful because this is all assembled into one piece over here so you don't need to worry about the only exposed part really to the high voltage is this piece over here and otherwise everything comes out the hot neutral and ground so that you can wire it right to your transformer and if you're using this style of a transformer you could probably wire it and solder it directly and put some heat shrink over it and really reduce your exposure to 120 volts or 240 volts depending on what part of the world you're in another thing I'm going to use and you've seen these before I've used them in other power supply designs this is a voltmeter and ammeter and since I'm building a very variable supply. I think that would be a very handy thing to have to be able to know what voltage I'm at and also of course to know what current I'm putting. You could also get straight voltmeter panels if you're not concerned about the current but I think that's a useful thing to know with a bench power supply. Now down over here I have a number of components and which ones I use will depend upon which chassis I go with. Now common to them of course is the voltage regulator, the uh, LD1085 voltage regulator that I'll be using for this design and I've also got these little heat sinks for the voltage regulator and they just snap onto the voltage regulator and it's a lot easier than trying to rely on the chassis especially because the tab of this is connected to the uh, center pin uh, you can just have a heat sink free floating and I think these should be good enough to vent the heat off of this even at full power now for the front I'm going to use this uh, multi-turn pot this 10 turn pot and that way I'll be able able to more accurately dial in the voltage that I want. Now if I use the larger case, and I'm kind of gravitating toward that, I can also put this on, and what this is is a four position rotary switch. And uh, with this, what I can do is I can allow it to select voltages. I'll connect one end of the rotary switch to the uh, 10 turn pot, and the other three uh, will go to these, and these are just little trim pots, and these are 10 turn pots, and so they'll be more accurate than the ones I showed you in the experiment with the LM317, and they should allow me to select between a number of pre-selected voltages, and in my case I'm going to do 3.3 5 and 12 volts but of course you could select different voltages and you don't have to use a four position rotary switch you can get a number of different ones i got this switch um up on digikey i believe and uh, 
I couldn't really find an equivalent one on Amazon, but that's a Canadian Amazon. I think the American one had one. There also were some other rotary switches on Amazon, but they had more than four positions, and I thought three extra voltages was quite sufficient. You can also get these, of course, with less positions if you only want to switch between one fixed voltage and a variable one. Or you could just ignore it and just use this and have a variable output on your power supply, because really, the design of the supply is up to you. What is it that you actually need from a bent power power supply and that's the beauty about building your own stuff and otherwise I've just got the terminals that we're going to be using for the output of the power supply pretty standard stuff for banana plugs and I've got a couple of bridge rectifiers um, if I use the printed circuit board design I'll use this one otherwise I can bolt this to the chassis if I use the tall chassis over here so uh, an example of the various parts that you can choose for your power supply. Again, I'll probably use the smaller transformer. I think I mentioned before these are 16 volt center tap transformers. And uh, so now let's go and prototype our power supply and then we will actually start building it. Okay, here's my test setup where I'm just prototyping the design for my power supply. Now, I'm powering this off of my low current transformer. I'm using the center tap, which is giving me about just a little under 18 volts AC. I'm feeding the bridge rectifier over here. Here's the big filter capacitor. Here's my low dropout voltage regulator. And I've got an LED on the output at the moment. I've got the output uh, hooked up to a multimeter over here so you can see the voltage. And um, the meter on the front here seems to be about 0.1 of a volt off of what the multimeter is reading and that's pretty persistent over the range and I can dial it down over here to about its lower voltage and we'll keep going down can actually drop quite low and here's two volts and I still have a little bit below that 1.9 1.8 volts and so that's the low end of it and if I turn the potentiometer all the way to the other end and it's a 10 turn pot, so it's a bit of a journey, but it does allow you to dial in pretty precisely on the voltage that you want. And the other end is up near about 20 volts. Here we go, it says 19.5 here, 19.76. So you can see this panel meter isn't exactly perfect. And at that uh, voltage, even this LED I have on the output is consuming enough current to register on the meter over there. Um, I'll consume a bit more current. Let's just drop this down to maybe about 10 volts over here. I'll go down a bit more. Oops, there we go. Oh. Here we are. Let's call it 10 volts. And I've got uh, my load over here, 316 ohm resistors in series, uh, power resistors. I'm just going to try to put this across the output over here. You notice how it drops the voltage like crazy. This is a low current power transformer. Uh, you can see that I'm reading current over here, 230 milliamps, which is close to what the transformer is rated at actually. I think it's a 300 milliamp transformer. Now I'm just going to use this meter over here. This is going to measure the input voltage right off the rectifier. So the raw uh, DC voltage if you wish. And I'll just connect the meter there. And I'm getting about 22.2 volts DC going into the regulator. And right now 10.2 going out. Now I really haven't had any load on this. And um, there's a slight, slight bit of heat there that I can detect if I really hold my fingers on it, but right now it's pretty low, and it should be lower than it is with something like the LM317 because of it being a low dropout regulator. While I was breadboarding, I used this uh, potentiometer, this 10-turn uh, trim pot. It's also a precision pot, and this is a 1K value, and I used it to determine the value of the other resistor, so I got the maximum range with my pot over here. So I've got a value of 510 ohms in there. Another value, which I wrote on the schematic, is 560 ohms. You could try but I would actually recommend you throw a trim pot inside there and determine what the best value for yours is. What you're looking for one is where you get the 10 turn pot turned all the way to one end and it's the maximum voltage and uh, the other end the minimum voltage. If you don't have it right when you start turning it up you'll get about halfway or three quarters of the way up and you'll be at the maximum voltage and the rest of it is useless. So you get the best range by fine tuning that resistor but if you don't want to do that try 510 or 560 ohms. Uh, there's a little tantalum capacitor on my output here and of course the meter is attached so that uh, the common of the circuit over here is not the ground over here because it uses that uh, it's dropping resistor to measure current 
current is on the ground side, so you have to remember that when you're wiring it, that what is negative here is not ground, it's only what's negative on the other side, which is confusingly a red wire, but that's how it came. So anyway, I think I got a good design. I'll show you the schematic for it right now, and then we'll get to building it and putting it into a box. Now when building a DC power supply with a variable output, a good choice for voltage regulator would of course be the LM317. As we've already seen, this is a very easy to use device and it has very good performance. However, I'm going to be using a different voltage regulator, the LD1085. This is a pin-for-pin -pin equivalent of the LM317, but the LD1085 is a low dropout regulator and has improved performance and gives off less heat. Both devices have similar specifications, but as you can see, the LD1085 has superior current handling performance, so it will allow us to build a 3 ampere regulated power supply. Because the LD1085 has the same pinout as the LM317, our final schematic looks a lot like the test circuit we looked at earlier. Note that the power transformer connection is probably oversimplified, as many power transformers have multiple windings to accommodate both 220 and 120 volts, and need to be wired appropriately. Your power transformer will come with a wiring diagram that you'll need to follow. For the bridge rectifier, you can use any device that handles up to 5 amperes at about 50 volts. You could use a bridge rectifier module, or if you wish, you could just use 4 diodes. I used a 2000 microfarad 63 volt filter capacitor. You can use any value similar to 2000 microfarads, and you can use multiple capacitors in parallel as well. Just make certain that you choose a voltage rating for the capacitor that's high enough for the 24 volt output that we expect to get from our bridge rectifier. I chose a 63 volt one because I really like to over specify my capacitors. You'll also notice there's an output capacitor, in my case I used a 2.2 microfarad tantalum capacitor, but any value up to 10 microfarads would work as well, and you could also use an electrolytic capacitor. Note that both the filter capacitor and the output capacitor are polarized and need to be inserted in the correct direction. You certainly don't want to wire these in backwards. To control the voltage level, I used a 10K 10 turn precision potentiometer, but you could use a regular 10K pod as well. You'll note that in the voltage divider circuit for the voltage reference, the 560 ohm resistor has a notation by it that says it was determined by experimentation. On my solderless breadboard, I used a 1K precision trim pot to determine this value. In fact, in my final design, I'm going to keep the trim pot because it will allow me to just fine tune the voltage value. You can fine tune this value if you find out that your maximum voltage is not at the maximum length of your potentiometer. This allows you to get the most precision from the design. Now as it is, this is a good variable power supply, but I want to add two features to it. I want to add some fixed and variable voltages to it, and I also want to add an output voltage meter. In order to do that, I need to wire into a couple of points here. Point A is the voltage control point. This is where we send the control voltage to the IC to determine the output voltage. Point B is the negative side, which at this point should not be connected to ground if you plan on using an output meter. Point C is the unregulated 24 volts DC that we're going to get from our bridge rectifier, given that we're giving it 18 volts from the transformer. To add our voltage selector, we'll be using a 4 position rotary switch, 3 10K trim pots, and a 10K pot. All of the potentiometers I used were precision 10 turn potentiometers. The rotary switch is wired to select only one of these potentiometers and use it as the voltage control. This is the wiring diagram for the volt and ammeter that I'm using in my power supply. If you're using a different module, you'll want to check its wiring diagram as it may differ from this one. In my module, the negative side is used to detect the current, and this is why we can't ground the negative output of the power supply. Note that the negative output on this is a red wire, and I know that's confusing, but that's just how the module is built. The smaller red wire is the power supply for the module, and we're connecting it to the unregulated 24 volt DC output of our power supply. 
The positive output just flows right through and it is sensed by the yellow wire on the module. Now you may not want to have the output meter or even the multiple voltage selector. In that case the diagram over here is all that you need and you can safely ground the negative side. And so now I'm going to go and build my power supply. Now no matter what style of chassis you use, you're going to need to cut a couple of irregular shaped holes in order to mount a few things. For example, the power entry unit that has a switch and the fuse and the uh, jack for the power cord is a very irregular shaped device that's going to need to be placed onto the chassis. And the same goes for this meter over here. This meter is also a just a rectangle but it's more than just drilling a hole so you're going to need a way to cut into the metal and you could do it by drilling a hole and putting a hacksaw blade in but that's rather crude and a little bit difficult to do i've got a bit of a better solution over here for cutting metal on a chassis like this or like the face plates on this one and it's something called a nibbing tool now i'm not certain if you've seen one of these before i actually had one of these years and years ago and it lasted me for a long time and this one is identical to it and the uh, one that I had before I picked up about 30 years ago at uh, Radio Shack I think. Uh, this one I got on Amazon it's an inexpensive little tool. If you look at the tip of the nibbing tool when you press down the handle there's a little blade over here and it actually just eats into the metal and that's called nibbing and when you're using one of these things a couple of things you might want to note though first of all if you're going to do a lot of nibbing you're going to want to wear some gloves because first of all you're gonna rub your hand against this uh, little thing over here and you'll probably get a blister if you do enough of it but another reason for wearing gloves of course is that when you're cutting this type of metal you can sometimes get some sharp edges so you definitely want to protect your hands a another thing that you might want to consider is the use of goggles as well because you are going to be chewing out little bits of metal and if they happen to shoot up toward your eye that wouldn't be a very pleasant experience so keep that in mind now I'm just going to do a demo here and I won't put the gloves on because I'm just going to do a very little bit of nibbing uh, I've got a chassis over here and this is just an old uh, chassis it actually was used for an AB switch for a printer back in the days when we used uh, DB25 connectors and it's a nice box so I've kept it and as you can probably see from the back I've already done a little bit of nibbing on it over here and uh, I'll show you how this works I'll just go against an edge over here now normally if you start off with a blank panel like something like this you would end up drilling a 3 8 inch hole to pass the nibbing tool in but I have an entry for it here so I'll just do that and uh, you can see that I just nib something over here and I can keep going if I want to. I can go in and uh, nib the next bit over here and uh, I can just basically chew my way through in order to make a hole and you can also once you've done a piece down over here for example you could go sideways you could put your tool in this way and then start going down so I could start nibbing in this direction and so you draw the outline of what it is that you want to mount and then you can cut the hole for it and it works uh, in a reasonable size chassis most of the common chassis are a light enough gauge uh, metal to support this thing and it's a, a really useful tool I think it was about 20 bucks on Amazon so it's certainly not an expensive tool and a very useful one if you're building chassis for electronics now before you start cutting and drilling it's a very good idea to determine the optimum placement for the components in your project and you can do that just by taking some of the main components and fidgeting around with them. Now I'm going to be building the power supply in the low profile case so it's going to require that low profile transformer that is mounted on either a perf board or printed circuit board. Perf board in my case even if you're designing a printed circuit board it's a good idea to take a perf board out of the correct size if you have it and just move move your components around just to get an idea of the best physical placement before you start deciding where to lay the traces down. Now this is sort of the layout I've come out with right now. The final product may be a little bit of an adjustment with it but I like it because the transformer is pretty well in the center of the chassis. It's not quite centered but it's pretty close and that means that the weight won't be off on one side. Um, now over here I've got the power entry module and it's going to go back over here. It'll have enough room for the wire to clear 
you remember it's going to be a bit further forward. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to just cut the ends off of this and solder these wires directly to where they go, in this case onto the transformer and to the ground, because these have lugs on the other end so I can disconnect them and I'm going to have to do that in order to mount the module anyway but I'm trying to avoid having connectors on the circuit board because I want every connection just to be a good durable solder connection if possible. Now uh, on the rest of the circuit board I'm going to have to put the bridge rectifier, some big capacitors and of course the voltage regulator itself. I've also got my three little trim pots that I'm going to use to set the fixed voltages and there's a few other components but there's plenty of space there for it. Now I've decided that I'm going to place the uh, potentiometer to do the variable voltage on this end and then next to it I'm going to place the switch which selects between the fixed voltages and between the variable voltage and over here, not quite centered, but um, in, centered in the group of components on the front, I'll place the voltmeter and ammeter, and so that'll go into the panel over here, so I'll have to do some measurements to figure out where to cut for that. And on the very end, I will place the uh, output terminals that I'm going to be using so that I can actually have my output. And so everything I think should be nicely balanced for weight, uh, it should be nicely functional. And so I'm going to start making some measurements and start cutting the chassis. Now there are a number of design considerations when you're laying out the components for your power supply and I wanted to go over them. Some of them of course have to do with safety and the other ones have to do with performance. Now first of all safety. In this design I've got one circuit board that's going to handle just about everything and nothing is soldered onto the board right now by the way. I'm just trying to place the components. Now I've got all of my AC stuff, all of my high voltage AC coming in over here and on this side of the board I've got all of my DC, my lower voltage DC out, the voltage regulator and all. And this is actually an important thing to do to physically separate both the high voltage stuff and the low voltage stuff and you'll see that on commercial designs as well. Now another safety consideration in this design and it may just be unique to this design is that I have used brass standoffs to mount everything and I used extra standoffs by the way around the transformer because of the weight of it. But over here in this corner I noticed that with my power entry I've got one wire, this one specifically, that comes rather close to this standoff. Now it's not touching it in any way but it's pretty close and it made me a bit nervous because of course the standoff is going to the chassis which is grounded. And so I replaced that standoff with a nylon one. So I've got brass ones everywhere else but a nylon one in this corner just to keep things a bit safer. Now another thing you want to consider is the thermal thing. Now this transformer is going to give off some heat. It's in the middle of the enclosure right now. Now over here I've got my low voltage DC stuff and there's a couple of items here specifically the regulator and possibly the bridge rectifier that could give off some heat and I've got them up in the corner here and one reason for putting them at the back is that on my chassis I've got these vents and the vents are more toward the back so I wanted to make sure there was some airflow for those components. Otherwise you also want to try to keep things neat so in order to do that I've made this little assembly and this is my uh, potentiometer and my rotary switch and they just go off to a DuPont connector which will be down on the board here and that's an easy way to connect those. Otherwise my meter, the one that goes at the front over here, is going to connect in with the wires it was provided with and they'll just go directly to the board. I'll also take a couple of output wires, some uh, heavier gauge wires, and bring those to some lugs and I can use that for the output over here. So this way my board can be a self-standing assembly that can be unplugged. This end over here will be soldered and these can unplug from the module. And so those are some of the design considerations I had for my power supply. Of course you may have a different transformer, a different box, a different mounting arrangement, and you'll have some unique considerations as well. 
Now, one important but often overlooked aspect of building a project is how you label the chassis. You need, of course, to label the chassis if you've got some controls or output jacks, just so you know what they do. But it can also make the project look a lot more professional and can definitely make it more useful. Now, there's a number of different ways you could go about labeling. If you're not that concerned about the appearance and just want to do something practical, then you can use something like this. And this, of course, is just a label maker. It allows you to make various sizes of labels and it lets you choose from different fonts etc. I've got a standard white label cartridge inside here right now but you can also get clear label cartridges and so those can look fairly good on the chassis because it'll allow the chassis background to come through. You've probably already got something like this around your home or office anyway. If not they're fairly inexpensive and they're pretty useful for a lot of things so you probably want to pick one up. There are other methods however of making it a little more professional type of a label. One that I've used for years is this. Now these are rub-on transfer rings. They basically you place this over the area that you want to place the label and then you just use a pencil or something to rub it on the top and it transfers the labeling onto the bottom and you can make a pretty professional looking label using this stuff. Now this is getting a little harder to find. It used to be very easy to find rub-on transferring. You went to an art or a drafting supply store and they'd have acres and acres of this stuff, mostly under the Letraset brand name, although it's available under different brands. For example, this is not Letraset brand over here. However, this has become a little more difficult to find in recent years because the original use for this was for drafts people who were doing this on their blueprints and their drawings and they had to make labels on them. Now, of course, they do all of that with computers, so there really isn't that much of a need for it. So it's a little bit difficult to find. I actually found a good source for this is eBay and there's a place out in the Netherlands that seems to have quite a bit of it so it's not bad stuff to have around your shop for labeling chassis. Another method that I just recently tried and I tried it on this project is to use this laser water slide decal paper. Now as the name would imply this is for a laser printer but you can also get it for inkjet printers as well too but it's a different type of a paper. Now water slide decal paper is interesting stuff. If you've ever used a model um, airplanes or build some other type of a model, you may have run into water slide decal paper. It isn't the kind of decal that you just peel off the back and stick. Instead, you soak it in water to remove the back and then you press it down. And it's a bit of a technique that uh, will require a bit of experimenting. I used it on the project today and I had to do it a couple of times before I got it correct. Now this laser paper doesn't require anything except the paper itself and the Put it through your laser printer and it wasn't the easiest thing to put through my laser printer if you have a printer that can do a straight through path it would work a lot better mine unfortunately isn't but i managed to print a few of them and i managed to destroy a few of them too before i got the technique of putting it on with uh, some of these, for example, the ones for inkjet, you actually, after printing it, need to spray on a compound in order to thicken it up a bit before you uh, peel the backing off. But you don't need to do that with this laser paper. Now, regardless of whether you're using this or a rub-on transfer, is another thing you might want to take a look at is something like this. And this is clear, transparent um, plastic, basically, that uh, you it's a clear finish that you can spray on to thicken and I've used this for a number of different things. It's great to use on chassis because after a while with wear and tear things like rub-on transfers are going to wear off and this stuff can put a coating over them that's transparent and yet protects them. I use them for other things too. If you notice the big blue pegboard I have behind me with all the tools, well that's sprayed with a couple of coats of this as well and it's lasted about six years. It's very durable so this is easily picked up at any hardware store. I think you can also get it at Amazon. And I'll show you the results. I used the laser water slide stepple paper and this was what I ended up with for my uh, my chassis. Now it's not the most perfect looking thing in the world but it does do 
do the purpose. I mean, it gives me the labels for all the different controls. I've got the positive and negative output. I didn't really need a label for my ammeter and voltmeter because its function was obvious. But the voltage selection over here, that's a good thing to have labeled. And the adjustment voltage is labeled. And I used the water slide decal paper. Now, if you are using this stuff, you just soak it in water for just a few seconds. It doesn't have to be in there for long. Then place the entire thing down with the backing on it sort of hold one edge of it and start pulling the backing off and go along here and smooth it down and as I said it took me a few tries but I ended up getting it so I got my chassis all nibbed out and cut out it's nibbed out in the back over here for the power entry module and it's drilled so it's ready to go and it is all labeled as well so I'm now ready to do the final assembly of my power supply. I've got my circuit board all wired up, and I've got my chassis all prepared. It's all labeled, and all of the components that go on to the chassis are there right now. So let's take a look at the circuit board. Now, I did mine on perf board, but of course this would be an excellent candidate for a printed circuit board. And as you can see, the dominant uh, feature of it is, of course, the transformer with its input side over here and its output side over here. Now my transformer needed to be strapped. I needed to put the two input coils in parallel because I'm using 120 volts. Had I been using 220 volts, it would have gone in series. And I also had to put these coils in series to get the full output voltage. This is an 18 volt transformer. Now uh, you can see on this side of the board, I've got all the DC components, the rectifier, the voltage regulator itself, uh, the three pots for adjusting the three voltages, the fixed voltages that I have, and also another trim pot, and this is the one that I'm using for the other resistor in the voltage divider circuit. And I just decided to use that so that if I needed to fine tune it, I could just use the pot over here. And here's a connector that goes over to the two controls I have in the front. And otherwise, I've got two leads that go out and snap on to the uh, meter, to the ammeter. And these two leads here, of course, are the output leads themselves. This is all the input stuff for the uh, power, for the AC power and for the ground. And speaking of ground, I've got something a little bit odd over here, I guess. Because I'm using a perf board, not a printed circuit board, what I did is I took a lug, I took a circular lug, and put it down here on the board, if you can see that. And then on the bottom of it over here, that I've had some wires coming in from the lug. This is my main grounding point. And I wired this up, as you can see, mostly with this 20-gauge uh, wire. This thicker wire over here is 16-gauge wire, and this is actually silicone wire. I have it left over from my outdoor robot project and thought that I would use it. But otherwise, I've used 20-gauge wire, except down over here. If you can see, these wires are a little hard to see because I used green on a green background. But but um, these are the wires that are just using wire wrap wire, and they're going to the resistor and switch because this is a high resistance section and the low current section. So wire wrap wire is by far easier to work with, but I use the heavier gauge wire for everything else because of the currents that we're going to be carrying. And so that's the circuit board itself. I'll just put this aside and we'll look at the chassis. Now here's the chassis. And uh, as you can see, I've got the front panel of the chassis all done. I've got the uh, switch over here to select my voltage. And I've got my voltage adjustment. I've got the ammeter mounted here. And I've got the, uh, the output terminals, the positive and negative, mounted over here. And uh, you can see that inside the chassis, I put some plastic tape just down under where the circuit board was, just another precaution because the chassis is grounded. And if anything got lodged underneath the board and touched one of the 120 volt leads, I know it's very, very unlikely, but you do have to remember it's being worked on in a workshop. There could be a little nut or something that would make it through the panel, through the ventilation holes into that. You got to think of the worst case scenarios and try to prevent it from happening. So you can see also I've got the uh, power entry on the back over here. That's all set up as well. So this is good to go. Uh, this uh, one post over here again is uh, being done with a nylon post. Everything else is brass. I'm ready to mount my board on, connect it up, and then I should have a working power supply.
And so here's our final product, our power supply. It's all plugged in and ready to go. I still have the case off of it, but otherwise it's complete. All of the front panel controls and the uh, meter are hooked up. And so is the 120 volts AC. And I do have 120 volts on it now, but I haven't flipped it on. So let's just do that. And as you can see, we have an output voltage. It's reading 9.9 .9 volts. I'm on the adjustable voltage over here, so I can set my voltage down quite low. Uh, let's see what the minimum level is. It's about 1.4 volts. And if I go all the way to the other end, and it's a 10-turn pot, so I've got several turns to give it. near the end there we are 23.5 volts so that's almost the voltage that we get off of the rectifier and that's because of course we have a low dropout regulator I'm going to set this back down to about 10 volts now and the 10 turn pot makes it very easy to dial in the exact voltage there we go there's 10 volts now of course i have the selector switch over here so i have 3.3 .3 volts 5 volts and 12 volts and those levels naturally were set by those three trim pots on the circuit board so if you want to use different voltages you can set them accordingly now i want to do one thing here now i've got a resistive load and i'm going to put it onto the power supply right now at 10 volts and it's pulling about 0.7 of an amp here. I want you to notice that the 10 volts stayed at 10 volts, unlike the experiment that we did on the solderless breadboard where we had a very minimal current transformer on there. This transformer can give out a lot of current, so the voltage stays steady. And that's true when you go to the fixed voltage as well. There's 3.3, there's 5 volts and there's 12 volts and in all cases the voltage stays steady even when it's under load so it looks like it's a working power supply the only thing remaining to do is to put the cover onto it and then I'll have a new test instrument for my workbench one that I built myself now one very important consideration when building your own linear power supply is that of safety. You are, after all, connecting up to the AC line or mains voltage, and depending upon where you are in the world, that can range from 110 to 240 volts AC, and that voltage can be deadly. And so be very careful when you're working with that. Never work on it when it is live. I would strongly recommend using one of those power entry modules like I did. They're inexpensive, and they they have a solution that provides both a fuse and a switch and an enclosed module and it doesn't expose the AC. And if you're at all nervous about working with alternating current of that level, then simply don't do it. Use this video as a reference instead. Now, if you want some more information about linear power supplies, or if you'd like to get the parts list for the one that I constructed, you'll find all of that on the article that accompanies this video on the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. And there's a link right below the video to that article. While you're on the website, please consider signing up for my newsletter. It's not a sales letter. It's just my way of letting you know every now and then what is going on in the workshop. And it's great to be able to communicate with you. And all I need from you for that is your email address. Another thing you could sign up for if you want to discuss linear power supplies is the DroneBot Workshop forums and you'll find a number of like-minded people out there who can help you with your electronics projects if you're running into a problem or who would just like to hear about the latest thing that you're building and of course the forum is free to sign up for as well. And finally, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I always love getting new subscribers. It's really easy to do. All you got to do is click the red subscribe button and then hit that little bell notification and assuming you've enabled notifications on your YouTube you'll get notified every time I make a video. So until we meet next time please stay safe out there please take good care of yourself and I will see you again very soon here in the DroneBot workshop. Goodbye for now.